All right, this is Josh T. Franco interviewing Chinupa Hanska Luger at his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico on July 13th uh, for the Smithsonian Institution's Archives of American Arts Pandemic Oral History Project. So Chinupa, thanks for doing this. And this is the question we're starting with with everyone. It's 2020, there's two pandemics, uh, COVID-19 and a lot of anti-Black racism. Um, and we just wanna know how artists are doing. So how are you? How have you been since March? Uh, I'm good since March. I would say that both of those pandemics were uh, in place for a long time and they're just coming to a, to a head right now. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I live and I work at home and um, I do a lot of traveling and a lot of movement, put together a lot of exhibitions, but for the most part, um, uh, in the wake of of all of this, um, I have developed some 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 really needed clarity that um, I think the pace of our of our culture up until uh, this kind of like um, forced to pause and um, and shelter in place scenario. Uh, I, I feel like all of that has kind of like. Um, put into perspective certain things that the speed at which the world was moving, I couldn't grasp really. Um, and I and I say that because I, I the last two three years I've had a very um, uh, fast paced kind of kind of uh, uh, lifestyle that involved me working a lot in um, in institutional spaces. And, uh, and, and I did all of it with a conscious kind of like effort because I didn't go to grad school um, to be uh, uh, kind of like anchored within those spaces um, that oftentimes grad school kind of like uh, uh, you, they become accessible because you're working within those fields. Um, because I bypassed it, I felt like that it was important that I had to put a pause on my um, on my studio practice and focus a lot of, of um, <laughs> what I colloquially would call jaw work, you know, uh, a lot of talks. Uh, of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, but a lot of, a lot of uh, be becoming a lot more, I guess, uh, embedded in the social kind of aspect of art making that the, um, the private studio practice, um, didn't necessarily have a, a driving need for, you know, especially when we're talking like economics, you know, so the, the, the economics of a studio practice and like selling work through galleries and all of that sort of stuff um, can sustain you in a way, uh, but to be involved in institutional and academic spaces, there's a lot of engagement that's involved in that. And, um, and I had developed uh, an aspect of my practice that uh, was heavily socially um, engineered, you know? Uh, and so that forced me to be out in the public, travel, uh, which was nice. Uh, it's funny because it's, uh, I guess my, 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 I don't know, ego self or projected, you know, self, self idea of who I am um, is very much so like, a hermit, you know, um, not a social person. I enjoy the the quietness of my studio, um, and I enjoy the alone time, really, um, uh, within that. And I'm a I'm a father. I have two little boys. Um, my wife, Ginger. My son, Eo, and say my sons, Eo and Seisha. Um, all of that travel had like I was working towards developing security and comfort for that but in the process did not engage or be a part of that because I was so busy doing the other thing um, that provided all of that so I was doing all of the work but not uh, recognizing or participating in any of the benefits of that so um, as shelter in place kind of uh, came into into being I realized how incredibly privileged and fortunate I was to live out in the mountains in the Southwest in New Mexico. Um, I'm, I'm 
probably about 20 minutes outside of Santa Fe. And my closest neighbor is, you know, maybe uh, 500 yards from, from me, you know? So there's, um, and we had been homeschooling my uh, children as well. So the, the social impact of like being um, closed didn't really hit us as hard as a lot of, a lot of people in the world, you know? Um, and I got to actually really like work on uh, a lot of things that at home that I, that I neglected or had taken for granted, you know? Um, and also like I built my house um, five years ago, but I never finished it. So I got to do like, I, I tiled my bathroom, you know, like something that all these little things that I was like, I have my certificate of occupancy, but we are literally living in a, a, a unfinished home, you know? Um, I got to do a lot of that stuff and gardening and, and um, uh, landscaping on my property. My whole property is like a slope. We, we live up against a mesa. And so there's nothing flat on my property. And because of that erosion and, and stuff like that were kind of like real factors that uh, building a, um, a home on kind of changes the way the, the water moves and flows. And I got to like do a lot of lifting of rocks and making little rock walls and seeding them and stuff like that that um it's funny because all of that stuff um is you know heavily labor intensive but i can do it with my family and my children um and i can also you know uh uh i can i can see the physical manifestation of that effort um as like metaphor for um like building a, a mental foundation that I think being a part of the world and flying and, and traveling and, and never being kind of like, I don't know, living out of a, out of a suitcase. I, I got really good at it. You know, I, I had like a, a travel bag that I could fit like three pairs of pants, uh, enough underwear for the stay and like three t-shirts and cycled through for like, if I was gone for two weeks or two months, I, I could manage it, you know? Um, but that's like a strange way to live, you know, uh, but you get acclimated to it and it, and it becomes normal. And, uh, and, and, and also it, um, it also feeds like your, your ego, you know, of being like, oh, people want me to talk. And so I'm going to show up and be that, you know, um, but is it true to who you are is like another question. So all of this has been really helpful to kind of like ground me and um, and make me remember what is truly important and to not forget about that when I'm wrapped up in the, the movement of, of our society, you know? Yeah, that collusion of the jet age and what the artist career is supposed to look like has definitely, is what you're talking about, I think, and we all feel it. And I myself, you know, I'm on the road two weeks out of the month in a typical year, and I haven't traveled once since mid-March, and it's crazy. Um, it's a huge difference, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, so you're rooting a lot at home. I'm also, you know, Santa Fe is such an important node for decades, if not centuries, centuries, if you consider, um, all Americans, uh, yeah. and American, it's, you know, this important nexus for American art. And I'm wondering too, you know, a lot of this travel takes artists away from their home communities, not just their family, but who they were in their art community at home. Are you rerouting in that way in Santa Fe? And do you see how Santa Fe is kind of weathering this? Um, not, I, I'm not really actually, because I have, um, one, I'm not from this place. I'm from North Dakota uh, okay. and, and I moved here because of its importance as a node. I, I moved to, to Santa Fe to go to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, and that's where I got my undergrad. And, um, and then, from after that point, uh, you know, I started working within the the gallery art kind of field um, and and moving work through through that whole system. And Santa Fe had a a has a um, you know for for native art it's a it's a total apex you know as far as as far as um, uh, part of the popular culture's kind of like experience and knowledge, you know, Santa Fe is aware of its dependence on native art as an economic driver for the city itself. Um, and then you tie in um, a lot of the 
uh, you know, late modernists and, and whatnot, your O'Keeffe's and your, your um, variety of people who, who've come to the Southwest and, and fell in love with the landscape. And, um, and there's, there's all of that sort of stuff, but this is like where I live. My children were born in New Mexico, but I am, I am a river, I'm a river person from North Dakota, you know, um, and, and that always remains home for me. Um, and then my relationship to community here, I, I live rurally, like my community here is really, um, you know, I have peers who are, who live and work here and stuff like that. But for the most part, the trajectory of my, of my um, career has been outside of this space. Um, I don't do much work in Santa Fe uh, um, ever since I started kind of like moving towards more um, national global um, um, practice. And, and it's, it's fascinating to me, you know, it's fascinating to see all of that. Um, the one thing I'm really pleased with is uh, New Mexico's response to the, the, uh, they, because of relationship to the indigenous population, they were very um, uh, uh, astute to what was happening and responded quickly. Um, just because a lot of a lot of I mean Navajo Nation suffered great losses from from this pandemic, and a lot of it has to do with um, them being a part of a four you know their their reservation being on the four corners of four states, and um, and the landscape in which they're 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 that that's within there. There's a lot of tourism that that people escaping urban centers like went to the Southwest um, and part, primarily into Navajo Nation. And a lot of those folks don't have running water, um, but you know, you, I, I see that a lot because it's it's happening up in North Dakota and South Dakota, where I'm from right now. Like the state's response to to the pandemic is very relaxed, but the effect of it on the indigenous communities have, who don't have as much access to um, um, medical response and or um, I mean, there's a lot of homes where I'm from that don't have running water, you know, or, or um, yeah, there's a whole variety of, of things. Plus the social aspect of these communities, you know, um, the houses are full of people, you know, there's, there's very few, you know, single occupant apartments, you know. Um, and so just the spread of that, I, I feel like New Mexico did a really good job at responding to that. And that makes me happy to be a part of this state and, and, um, and their, um, I guess, just general, uh, uh, knowledge and acceptance and, um, and appreciation of its indigenous population. You know, it recognizes it where a lot of the states don't. So I appreciated that here. That's great. That's good to hear about New Mexico. And is, is your family doing okay in Dakota? Um, yeah, they're, they're doing pretty good. I have, it's funny, my, my, um, my sister's husband they live in phoenix and he came down with with covid um in this second kind of burst of of uh of the virus in um in arizona you know um they were quick to like the everything's fine and the summer's coming and that's going to kill everything you know but the uh the my sister works in the medical field and so she was always just keeping her knees bent waiting for this kind of like second um uh, occurrence and lo and behold you know there it is but this is like this is that response that i'm saying that i appreciated about new mexico compared to like say your arizona's or your your nevada's you know um yeah or utah's i guess sorry <laughs> <laughs> um so one thing we've been, I've been asking people too is what they see i mean whether I don't know how much media you watch, that I have to watch none, but uh, what in kind of mainstream accounts of what's been happening this year, what do you see that's missing? Um, gosh. You know, I don't, well, one, I don't, I don't pay that much attention. You know, I'll get, I'll get little alerts on my phone, my giant robot, you know, um, that's connected to everything else. But for the most part, um, I truly believe that, you know, most of the spaces that I can truly have any sort of change or, or affect change in are those spaces that I can directly touch. Um, and so um, in response to that, like, you know, there's a lot of, there are, there are a lot of things that I think 
are are um, being set, sensationalized through media um, just because it is following a model of of um, yeah, I don't know, what we've what we've developed as entertainment, you know. Um, and so the entertainment factor is the factor that everybody focuses on, and that is the like the um, graphic or brutal or or um, violent or or um, uh, pitiful, you know, uh, aspects of all of these sorts of movements. But um, uh, from my experience, being in some of those spaces, uh, it, you know trying to affect change directly uh, on, on, the, the, on the front of some of these lines. What I recognize is for the most part, what is being documented and shared through media is 15% of what's actually happening. And there's a lot of beautiful, um, connected and empathetic and compassionate responses that aren't being celebrated in response to how we engage with what media shares with us. So, um, it, it perpetuates this idea of so much of this being struggle, you know, um, and doesn't celebrate the incredible changes and efforts and movements of, of people in response to that hardship, you know, um, the, the, we are, we are human beings subject to, um, to difficult circumstances, but we are not the difficult circumstance, you know? Um, and so watching us respond, bond to that and and uh i think is some of the most beautiful aspects of us um and i don't know if it's being amplified in in any sort of way through through media you know as as future generations look back at this time through the video logs of our of our experience i hope that it, that they don't miss the fact that there has been incredible growth and um compassion and empathy uh between people and cultures and um and mechanisms and systems that we participate in you know yeah i think not for everyone but for a lot of people and sectors the idea of what productivity is has changed for the better and hopefully that's permanent change so that's yeah. work yeah especially for artists who are expected to come and speak and be on plans all the time um you know what's going to take that space will be interesting do you have any guesses well i mean the thing that's most interesting to me is that for since the develop of development of the institution and the and the um, the you know center for cataloging <coughs> life experiences and 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 the world you know um, for the most part these have become the hubs for um, where culture lives you know and the the that idea is void you know it's 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 empty. Like the only thing that fills those spaces is, is the echo of where culture lives, you know, and it's in constant flux and constant change. And I think the flexibility and the movement, um, the adaptability of artists and just human beings in general, um, I think is going to come to a to a head and that like power dynamic between um, uh, uh, artists being dependent on museums and institutions to show their work. Um, I think, I think we're, we're becoming, every year, it, it becomes more and more um, uh, understood that they can only share the echo of that, you know, and they can't actually share it in real time and what's, what's happening. So anything that we see in any sort of exhibition is at least a year old and the speed at which we experience information um that's a, that's like a lifetime you know like a year old exhibition is is uh that's some that's some old stuff according yeah. to that time you know cosmic um, right travel time right right and just i mean the speed of thought right like this is the thing we're having a conversation right now via a satellite you know um this conversation would have taken weeks in you know 20 years ago and uh, um, I don't know, just all of that sort of stuff is becoming, um, as, as we're adapting to these new kind of ways of communication and, and, um, and response to that, I think it's also putting a lot of pressure and weight on the brick and mortar of our society, you know? Um, those ships don't turn, you know? <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they're too heavy. Um, whereas we can be, you know, careening 
at breakneck speed towards a, 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 a cliff, we have the we have the flexibility to move and adapt um, and respond without a tremendous you know catastrophe. And as an artist, like I'm a single individual, and and um, I can I can survive a scraped knee. You know, I can survive like uh, uh, stopping dead and rolling into the dirt. Whereas the mechanisms that we've developed as a society. Those structures will topple and never be again, you know, to, to adapt that quickly. Um, and I think that also shifts the importance of like what, um, what an artist is or what a, what a human is as a, co a contributor to um, where culture lives, you know, um, versus like having to go to a museum or institution to, to experience that. Um, we share it instantly on our social media feeds. And there's a lag with all of that, you know, like we put our best foot forward um, under those, those uh, models that we use. Um, this new infrastructure of, of culture and share, you know, which is the internet, it's a baby and, and it hasn't developed fully yet. And, and right, and it's also got to, it's also got to deal with people like me who were born before the internet, who I'm, I'm, I'm deeply, I believe that like, 87 to 90 percent of all trolls on the internet are my age or older you know um they're they don't know how to respond to to uh, an open dialogue you know is that just like uh yeah just hide out and talk shit like that's 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 my generation stuff you know um uh hopefully we can get past that and and not like mess up the 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 internet in the process <laughs> yeah my partner is a gen xer and i know about the talking shit yeah um so in the last little wrap up here what do you want to tell the artists in a hundred years about what it was like to be an american artist in 2020 yeah um well there was a place called america i want to start <laughs> <with> that <laughs> And uh, it was an experiment, you know? Um, it was an experiment that had, uh, that was desperate. It was a desperate experiment. And, um, and it was built on a lot of brutality. And, and, but a lot of that brutality was, was learned. Um, America was an experiment to, to try to alleviate all of that, that pressure and that tension. But, hurt people hurt people and 2020 we were really taking a hard close look at the effect of that on on each other and on the environment um and uh you know hopefully you're living in the in the um the calm after the wake of this moment in a hundred years um but i don't um I, I think it took about 500 years to get to the place that we are, and I don't expect change to happen radically overnight. Um, I think it takes time. And like any good aspect of, of community and society, um, there should be consensus developed rather than majority rule, and consensus takes time. So, you know, at this point in history, I, I think it's important that we begin to talk to one another and actually use all of the incredible um, technology that we have to, to develop a, a, a better protocols for communication. Um, we're not, I, I'm not gonna survive this. I'm not gonna live in the beautiful place that I can imagine in my head but I will die trying, you know, I will die trying because I believe in us and I know that we will survive this. Awesome. I'm going to end it right there. Thanks, Geneva. <laughs> yeah.